My friends, 343 have done the impossible. They've managed to release a new Halo Infinite season only three months after the previous one. Yes, that's right, Halo Infinite Season 4, titled Infection, can you guess what's going to be in this season, has finally arrived. And we have quite a lot to talk about regarding this season, so let's waste no time and jump right in. If you do enjoy, subscribe, like down below, the usual stuff. Marathon Law videos starting next week, very exciting, but let's get into the matter at hand. Halo Infinite Season 4 Infection. Now, Season 4 does bring with it quite a lot of content. When you take away the kind of context that surrounds the content that we're going to get to in a second, the raw volume of content in this update, I think, is really good, to be quite honest with you. Especially when you consider that this is an update releasing after they've hit that three-month seasonality. We've not had to wait six to ten months in between the last update and this one. This is coming only three months after the prior update. Season 4 is, by a long shot, Halo Infinite's biggest, adding what should have been there at launch patch yet. But it's just that. It's an update that finally adds even more stuff that should have been there at launch. So, I'm going to get this out of the way now. I'm going to say my views now and get this out of the way so I don't keep repeating myself when I talk about all the actual content in this update. Um, I don't think this update is some incredible 343W like I see some people saying, right? You don't get to do a victory lap for adding things like infection and a progression system over 19 months after the game came out. And also, after like 99.9% .9 of the 20 million players they had playing this game at launch have left and likely for good. I will not be giving out brownie points for things like infection and a progression system finally being added to the game because frankly, you're so far past the brownie point window, you're over in the goddamn salad bar. And so with that said, let's jump into Season 4's content, starting out with Infection. So Infection is finally here, and it's Infection. It's not been radically redesigned like they have done with some of the older returning modes in Infinite so far, like King of the Hill and Oddball, and that's a good thing. Infection did not need to be radically redesigned, and they haven't done like a Halo 4 flood thing where you can't customize what weapons the infected hold or anything like that. This is, for the most part, there are a few little tweaks here and there, but this is, for the most part, the infection that you know and love, and I think it plays pretty good in Infinite. It does seem quite polarizing, but personally, I kind of like the theming for infection in this game. It's very different to what we've had before with, like, Halo 5 and Halo 4 and Halo 2 Anniversary, and I like the changes that the Erratus and Banished Infected theming give to the maps in Infection as well. They don't just feel like standard maps. They feel like they have been consciously modified to make Infection feel more thematic and to have a better atmosphere. I think the Erratus effect on the Alpha and the Beta Infected honestly looks really, really cool. Um, Granted, nothing will ever top, or at least nothing has topped yet, Halo 2 Anniversaries, Flood Infected Spartans, but I think Eratus' theming for the Infected is probably my second favourite theming for Infected so far. The sword looks really cool as well. I'm kind of happy that they've not just copy and pasted the red energy sword from Campaign. They've actually kind of redesigned the energy sword and made it look a little bit corrupted and infected, which I think is cool. I will say having Eratus commentate the game so much is a little bit annoying, but I love what they've done with the Jeff Stitzer AI and how corrupted Jeff Stitzer is now that Eratus has infected the War Games machine that he is the AI of. I only had one shot. Hearing Jeff Stitzer almost in like an uncanny valley fashion and start stuttering on lines that you expect him to say flawlessly and have almost like conversations and arguments with Aratus and give out cool little like quips at the end of a round is really, really cool. Now, I know a lot of people aren't going to like the visual effects of the infected in this game, and granted, they would damage quite a lot of classic custom games if they were forced on you at all times. Thankfully, you can disable these visual effects in custom game settings, so certain modes like hide and seek and stuff won't be ruined by the glowing red Spartans. However, you can't change the audio effects, so regardless of what game mode you're playing, if it's infection-based, you're always going to have Eratus and all the banished theming over it, which it's a little bit annoying for some modes. Um, I personally don't really care that much, but if you don't like the Eratus voiceover, which I think it could be quite polarizing. The time will soon be over. Find your spirit and fight. I'm sorry, you can't disable it. However, I do have two sticking points with infection in this game. 
The first one pertains to the changes they've made to Last Man Standing. So in Infinite now, if you're the last survivor, then you only get 30 seconds as that last survivor. You only get 30 seconds as that really buffed up survivor with overshield and infinite ammo and a faster reload time, which I don't like because it just it gives you a very hard time cap on how much you can enjoy those bonuses that you've worked really hard to get. Like you, you are the last survivor. You deserve to enjoy those bonuses for literally as long as you can survive. But now there's just a 30 second timer on it. And as soon as that timer hits zero, doesn't matter if you're still alive and fine, the round just ends and I'm not a fan of that. And the second sticking point is the bulldog. It's not awful for infection, but it doesn't even hold a candle to the classic loading one shell at a time pump shotgun. The classic shotgun just should have been added to this game for infection. I don't understand why they got rid of the classic shotgun for the bulldog and I don't understand why they've not added it back for infection because the tension built from being backed up into a corner, loading one shell, firing it, loading one shell, that frantic shell loading, that mechanic was like a core mechanic of infection. And I think, at least personally, it is noticeable that it's not there in this game. Uh, infection in this game is still pretty fun, but I think it would be a lot better if it had the classic one shell at a time top loading shotgun. Besides that though, the fact that the infected have equipment and the, all the weapons on the map for the survivors honestly feel quite balanced. The only thing that doesn't feel balanced are the infinite ammo mounted machine guns, which feel very, very overpowered for survivors. But other than that, I'd say the balancing of the equipment and everything is pretty on point. So one of the core elements of the way that 343 designed infection in this game is to tie it in with the live service narrative to have Eratus infecting the war game simulator like we saw him do at the end of the season three cutscene and in doing that infect our infection games, right? It all feels very thematically tied together. Which leads me to my next point of utter bewilderment and confusion. Well, I'm confused, but I'm also not confused. you see why in a minute. Um, the cutscenes, the cinematics, and by the looks of it, the live service narrative. It's finished. In the trash. Yep, no more cutscenes, no more cinematics, and by the looks of it, no more live service narrative. It just kind of ends. Uh, and 343's reasoning is so they can fix the game instead of putting resources into that. I do find it quite funny how they don't have the resources to finish the live service narrative that the entire live service multiplayer is built around that was one of the main pitching points for the game's live service story and that is very clearly right in the middle of being told. It's like at the bang on middle point of the story. They don't have the resources to finish that, but don't you worry, they had the resources to redesign the shop. Hmm. <clears throat> I think it's quite clear where this game's priorities are at this point. Let's go find your checkbook. Ready? Here we go. All right, we're walking, we're swinging our feet. There you go, very nice. It really is a shame though, because as lame as the season two cutscenes were for the live service story, I genuinely enjoyed the season three ones. It really felt like they finally hit their stride with that story. And I think it was clear that it was finally starting to resonate with most fans. People seemed to really be enjoying it. Hell, the last live service like lore video that I made got almost a quarter of a million views, which is fucking insane, for, especially for the video like that it did insanely well people were interested and now it's just probably never gonna get a resolution if it gets any kind of resolution it'll be some waypoint blog that about seven people are gonna read um i i get it because they've fired oh this pisses me off every time i say it they fired the entire campaign team so there's no one really there to work on this kind of stuff anymore so i get why they've done it and yes putting resources towards fixing core game-breaking bugs with the game that have been there for upwards of 19 months is paramount, but this is Halo. The resource, the, it shouldn't be a toss-up between fixing the broken game and continuing to tell a story. Oh, This is a little bit unrelated, but I've got to say this, I hate the fact that they wheeled Sketch out to deliver this news instead of posting it on the official Halo account or posting it through any official Halo channel. It's never the people that make these very unpopular decisions that announce them, is it? It's never the people that make the decisions. They always have somebody else announce them to act as like a, a criticism shield. And I get that being on the community team means that that's part of your job, but I, I just, 
I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me. It was what they used to do with Joe as well. When Joe was at 343, every time Joe was in a Vidoc, you knew they were about to deliver some bad news. Every time without fail. It was like, it became like a Pavlovian response. Oh, Joe's there. Well, I guess they've cut something from the game. And it, I just don't like how they do that. I don't like how the people that make these decisions are never the ones that have to announce them. They have people that very likely strongly disagree with the decisions announce them. Just, I don't know, unrelated, but I just I just mentioned that because I felt bad for Sketch having to put that out and then get all the criticism, but I guess it is what it is. So then, let's talk about the two new maps that have come to Halo Infinite in Season 4. And I gotta say, 343, <laughs> at least visually, you've knocked it out of the park with these maps. The first one, the arena map, Forest, is absolutely fucking gorgeous. I would honestly go as far to say... This is one of like the probably, I couldn't rank them in my head right now, but probably top three most beautiful Halo multiplayer maps of all time, flat out. It's got that gorgeous Delta Halo, Halo 2 Sanctuary style aesthetic that we've really not seen much of since Halo 2, which is very welcome to see back. And you know what? Just walking around this map, taking in the incredible foreigner stone architecture, the massive trees, the like Yavin 4 or Endor style trees and the waterfalls and the, the massive like temples off in the background makes me want to do things that would get my channel deleted from YouTube to get a campaign DLC set in this kind of biome. This map, it plays well, but visually it is fucking gorgeous. Props. And then we have Scar, Halo Infinite's new BTV map. Now, again, visually, this map is gorgeous. The lighting in this is beautiful. I love the color palette of the grays and the oranges with the lava. This map is... <laughs> I hate to be like one of those guys that whenever he sees something with lava in, he's immediately like, oh, Mustafar, but... Mustafar. <laughs> I love that big, like, banished thing in the sky. I don't know what it is. It looks a bit like some kind of minecart system or something. It looks really, really cool seeing, seeing it floating in the sky. I love architecture in games, especially in Halo, that's so insanely big that it just makes everything else feel, like, dwarfed in comparison. And this kind of architecture, whatever this is meant to be, does that. And it looks really kind of ominous. M most Spanish architecture is designed to look ominous. And this looks really ominous floating in the sky. Whether it's a minecart system or a relay system. No idea. It just looks really damn cool. That said though, the layout of Scar, I'm not particularly a fan of. Um, or not as much the layout, more so just how claustrophobic it is, again, for a BTB map. It just feels like yet another Halo Infinite BTB map designed purely for infantry where most vehicles, heavy vehicles, very much so, just don't really have much room to breathe. Literally every 343 BTB map in Infinite, and you know what, not even just in Infinite, in like Halo 4 and well, Halo 5 didn't have any, but like Halo 4 kind of felt like this as well. Like, the most of the BTB maps are just too narrow and too laney for heavy vehicles to really get any breathing space. Every lane on Scar feels like it was purposely built to, and like almost measured to be just wide enough to fit a scorpion or a wraith through, but they don't have any breathing space. You're just asking to get boarded or EMP'd or instantly destroyed in these vehicles. The best way I can put it is that Infinite's BTB maps in particular don't feel like big team battle maps that were designed with vehicles in mind. They just feel like bigger arena maps. We need BTB maps with far more open space again, like Blood Gulch or Waterworks or Sand Trap or Sidewinder. Maps that allowed vehicles to really move around and breathe. Infinite's BTB maps just feel like they were designed for infantry combat first and foremost, which is like so backwards considering BTB is meant to be where vehicles shine. I don't know, hopefully the future BTB maps can kind of remedy that. Right then, the new equipment. We've got two new pieces of equipment in Halo Infinite Season 4. The first one being, well, okay, it's technically a power-up. It's the Quantum Translocator, right? So what this thing does, if you haven't seen yet, it's very similar to like a Wraith ability from Apex. You pop it and you spawn a portal and then you can run wherever you want. And then when you pop it again, you teleport back to that portal almost instantly. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't really have an opinion on this thing. Um, I think conceptually, it's kind of cool, but I've used it a good amount, and to be quite honest, I genuinely can't tell you if I like it, if I don't like it, if I think it's overpowered or underpowered, if I think it fits Halo's gameplay. I kind of just feel like I don't really have the skill set to be able to judge it, so I'm, I'm not going to. I don't know if that sounds like a cop-out at all. Hopefully it doesn't sound like a cop-out, but 
I just, I, I don't, I genuinely don't know what to think about this thing. I think it's going to be a long time before I can genuinely make a decision for it. I will say, it does feel like it was designed mostly for competitive, um, but I don't know, maybe it has some social use. I guarantee though, we're going to get some really cool custom games come out of this thing because 343 did confirm that when you go back through the portal, when you tap it again to go back, it keeps your momentum and velocity from when you were moving. So say you're on speed halo, like launching down the ramp, right? And you hit it again to go back through the portal. It's going to keep your speed and launch you at that speed, which is definitely going to result in some really cool custom games. So I'll give it that at least. That's the one thing I will say. I think it'll be great for custom games. And then we have the Threat Seeker, which is... I don't, I don't understand, I, I'm trying to work my brain around why this thing was ever even thought about. It's the most boring, pointless sandbox edition in this game yet. Out of all the possible new and returning ideas for equipment, we, we get an ever so slightly modified version of what is already arguably the most boring equipment in the sandbox, the threat sensor, I think the other one is. What this thing is, is literally, it's a threat sensor, except uh, when you fire it, it bounces, and then after it bounces, it then pings out, and if any enemies have line of sight with the ping, they're detected, and they're shown on your, on your screen through a wall like Promethean Vision, or like the threat sensor. It was meant to be a competitive version of the threat sensor, but like, why? We don't need more stuff like that for competitive. This is a Halo game that brought the Bruce back for the first time in 13 years in, or sorry, 11 years in an FPS and doesn't have the brute shot. And yet we're putting time into making this. I, I don't get it. Like, or even if that's not comparable because it's a, a weapon to an equipment, right? Let's look at the equipment. There's, there's still barely any neutral equipment in this game. You could have added the bubble shield or the regenerator, the grav lift, the trip mine. Hell, you could have even added something that was really stupid and gimmicky, but kind of fun every now and then, like the hologram. But instead we get threat sensor 2.0, except this time, it's less interesting because you can't stick it to your teammates and have them act as portable radars for you. Okay then, now it's time to talk about probably the tied biggest thing in this update, the progression system. It's, it's finally here. Now, if you take 19 months to make a progression system for a game, you better be making the best damn progression system the world has ever seen. It should encapsulate everything that people loved about the Halo 3 progression system and the Halo Reach progression system, but at the same time, mix in maybe one or two new features and elements that Halo's never really tried before to make it feel fresh yet familiar. It should be the magnum opus of Halo progression systems. And is it? No. It goes back to military ranks over the boring SR numbers of Halo 4 and Halo 5, which I'm a big fan of. I love that move. I've asked for it for years. But I still don't think the ranks in this game are anywhere near as interesting visually as Halo 3's or Reach's were. They lack a lot of the visual variety that Halo 3 and Halo Reach's ranks had, and most of them in this game kind of just look far too similar, which is only exacerbated by how incredibly repetitive they are, thanks to the emphasis on divisions, basically Halo's version of prestiges, like MCC system, over grades. So Halo 3 had 42 unique rank icons. Halo Reach had 50 unique rank icons. Halo Infinite has 17, and 15 of those 17 get repeated six times over thanks to the division system. In Halo 3 and Halo Reach, although the changes to each rank icon as you went up a grade were small, they were still noticeable, and they changed the actual rank symbol enough for you to notice when a grade 1 is different to a grade 2 or a grade 3. I really don't like the emphasis on this division system from bronze through to onyx, which is quite confusing because it's the exact same as the skill ranks over grades that Halo 3 and Halo Reach focused on so much. Not only do you end up repeating the exact same ranks so many times, but it makes the military ranks, the actual symbols themselves, hold less value than their colour. So for example, a silver five-star general isn't as high of a rank as an onyx private, which when you actually say it, it just sounds silly. 
Now, as for showing off your rank to other people, it does show it off at the start of the game, but that's only to the people that are assigned to, like, your squad. So, if you're in a BTB game, only three other people are going to see your rank at the start of a game, not the entire game. I really, really wish they'd made a conceited effort to add pre-game and post-game lobbies with this update, because pre-game and post-game lobbies synergize with ranks so well. Being able to see all the enemy's ranks and being able to show your rank off to, like, all your allies in your team and all the enemies was such a huge part of like Halo 3 and Halo Reach and the social experience that matchmaking created in those games that Infinite just doesn't have at all. But you know what? I could honestly forgive all of that if it weren't for the biggest stinger with this progression system. There are no meaningful rewards for ranking up whatsoever. The only rewards you get for ranking up are these emblems. You don't unlock any armor, because, of course, that has to be tied to the store. You don't even unlock coatings that represent each tier or rank or whatever that you get, or even something as simple as credits to spend on armor and coatings in the store. You just get these meaningless emblems for Halo Infinite's awful, redesigned and gutted emblem system that's significantly worse than the classic emblem system. Oh, and also, the actual emblems that you get are completely redundant. You unlock an emblem of a rank by hitting that rank. So your emblem is either the exact same as the one that's already displayed on your nameplate, or it's an emblem of a rank that's lower than what you are. Why would you want to display an emblem of a rank that's lower than what you are on your nameplate when that higher rank is already there? They just seem really redundant. Barring Halo 5, every progression system dating back to their inception in the Halo franchise has had armor unlocks for hitting certain ranks. Being rewarded for getting a new rank is an intrinsic part of the reward loop that a progression system creates. Having specific armor or something that is actually recognizable in-game, unlike the emblems that we get, tied to a rank gives you something genuinely meaningful to show off in-game. Okay, I'm just adding this in whilst editing. Halo.API data mined the entire progression system, and it turns out right now, at least, there is no unlock for hitting max rank hero, which is quite insane, but Sketch came in and seems to be alluding to the fact that there is something unlocked for hitting max rank, which, I mean, you'd hope, right? Especially after the whole thing with Halo 5 and the Watchdog coating being added in the game that came out after Halo 5 because people were so mad that Halo 5 didn't give you anything for hitting max rank. You'd hope that at the very least, this progression system would give you something meaningful for hitting max rank. And by the looks of it, it might do. Fingers crossed, it's actually armor and not just an emblem, but... At this point, who knows? I just think it sucks that we had to wait so ridiculously long for a progression system, and still, after having to wait that long, it doesn't really live up to expectations. It feels like there always has to be some kind of drawback or redesign when a core feature gets brought back like this for no apparent reason. And speaking of drawbacks or redesigns, let's talk about cross-core, because cross-core customization has officially begun, which is great. But there's a caveat. Crosscore has begun, but only for premium coatings. And not just any premium coatings. Only premium coatings that were unlocked in Season 4. So, if you have a core locked coating from a previous season that you unlocked that you really liked, well, you can't use that on other cores still. If you even bought a coating in Season 3, or Season 2, or any previous season, doesn't matter. Can't use it on the core still. Still core locked. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Forge... Now, I'm not going to sit here and spend ages talking about cross-core again, because frankly, that horse is better than Julius Caesar's horse, right? But I will say, I just think it sucks real bad that customization that was once a staple, a beloved staple of Halo, that allowed people to express themselves through the aesthetic of Halo that we all loved, and also that looks bloody fantastic in this game, for the most part, has been watered down to nothing more than a monetization avenue for 343 and xbox that's that's kind of just all customization is now all the coolness of it all the personalization of it nah it's just a monetization style now so speaking of customization and armor let's have a look at some of the new armor that was added with season four firstly we have the brand new core hazmat now i'm gonna be honest 
don't really like much of this. However, there is one helmet, Mark VI CBRN, that I absolutely love. Seeing a helmet that I love as much as classic Mark VI modified to be taken into biohazardous, nuclear, or radioactive environments is really, really cool. And I love how it kind of looks like Mark VI, like recognizable Mark VI, but with a hood and pipes. I, I like that a lot, but the rest of Hazmat, yeah, I'm not a fan. Roger, roger. There are some new Mark 7 helmets as well. Um, there's this one that's based on the Halo 3 Marine pilot helmet that's kind of cool, but the rest of them just kind of look meh. It really feels like they ran out of ideas for helmets a long time ago and have once again resorted to just scraping the bottom of the barrel for ideas and this is what we get. We're also going to be getting some more Yoroi armor this season too, but um... Let's just say, based on the leaks, these helmets aren't exactly Hayabusa. Season 4 is going to have a record number of events as well that all bring with them their free battle passes. I think there's going to be 5 events this season, which is quite a high number. 5 different events, not repeat ones like before, I think. But I will say, it does kind of suck that it's just going to be a battle pass for all of them. I really find battle passes to be a boring method of unlocking stuff, because the path to unlocking stuff in a battle pass is completely linear. It's not like in Halo 3 or Reach or Halo 4 where there are helmets that are unlocked for like achievements or challenges or commendations or stuff like that where people could unlock them in different pathways. Everyone is just down the exact same path unlocking everything at the exact same time with battle passes. So whenever you get something, it, unless you're the first person in the world to get that piece of armor by a long shot, it never really feels unique. Whereas when you've got some, a system, like I said, like Halo 3 or Reach or Halo 4s, where there are loads of different like branching pathways that you can go in to unlock stuff. Like, you, in Halo 4 was a great example, right? I could literally just like grind assassinations, get like 200 assassinations and unlock the Venator armor. Or I could grind like Dominion and get Gunyir, I think it was, or something like that, or Commando, right? But there's no like diversity in the pathways you can take to get armor in this game. It's just a battle pass. You go through tiers one through ten at the same rate and the same order as everyone else, and you get the armor at the same time as everyone else. It's just, I don't know, not that interesting. And finally, when it comes to customization, we need to talk about the expanded weapon customization. Now, weapon models have been a style of, cos of cosmetics for weapons for a while now, but they've never really been tapped into that much until now. And I gotta say, some of these new weapon models they've added, especially the BR ones and this one like bulky assault rifle one, look really, really, really nice. I'm a big fan of these. They look great. Now, I don't really play Infinite that much, besides when a new season comes out, but I'm gonna be honest, right? Now they're going down this expanded weapon customization pathway in an actual meaningful sense. If I did play Infinite frequently and they were to add like classic weapon skins for existing weapons. So for example, like, I don't know, they added like a Halo 3 sniper model for the sniper that replaces the animations, the sound effects and the model to be like literally the Halo 3 sniper. That would be the first time I would ever even consider giving the shop money in this game. I kind of hope they do that, to be honest with you, because it seems like a pretty insane thing to miss out on now that you are expanding weapon model customization. So, there's an idea for you, 343. I just gave you an idea for a microtransaction. That, yep, yep, you heard me right. You should definitely do that, though. So, what do you think about Infinite Season 4? Are you playing Halo Infinite frequently again? Do you plan on playing it frequently again? Or has it not done much to get you back into the game at all? And you're just kind of waiting with me in limbo to see whatever happens next with Halo. Let me know down below in the comments and keep it simple down there as per usual. Quick reminder, like I said at the start, Marathon Law videos begin next week. I'm so excited to start talking about Halo's sister universe. Oh, Marathon Law, my friends, is... Oh, it's some spicy stuff. I can't wait. So with that said, I'm going to round this video out and carry on working on my marathon content. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there, as per usual. And thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you all in the next one.